Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, brothers and sisters. And uh, welcome to this talk on the, on the topic of marriage and things that are related to that. One of the reasons why I think this topic is super important is because the trend in our communities regarding marriage and in particular marriage breakdown is heading in a very bad direction. And I'm sure everyone sitting here, maybe even youngsters, they know of a case of someone's marriage that has fallen apart and has ended in divorce. And I want to start with asking you a quick question, which is, in this country, amongst non-Muslims, what would you say is the percentage of divorce what percentage of all marriages are ending in divorce in this country? What kind of figure would you come up with? What do you think? 70. Someone 70? 70. 70%? 70 40, 50. 40, 50? What, what do you think? 30. 30%. <coughs> mm. 30%. Yes, young man at the back. That's a very specific number, mashallah. How did you pluck that one out? <laughs> right, okay. You're a statistician. I thought he's into his stats, mashallah. So according to the Office for National Statistics in, on, in 2012, they did a countrywide survey and they found that the rate of divorce back then was 42%, which means that nearly half of all marriages were ending in divorce. Um, that figure has increased to 47% now, but it's actually made more worse, or it's made worse because the rate of marriage has declined itself. So you've got less people getting married and more people getting divorced. Yeah. And another really interesting or shocking insight into the stats regarding marriage is that the average lifespan of a marriage from those that end with divorce is around 12 and a half years. Now the reason I find that shocking is that after 12 and a half years of marriage, it's not just two people now, there's children involved. And usually divorce doesn't end well for children. It has huge effects, most of them negative effects. Also, after 12 and a half years of marriage, you're thinking all these people that get divorced after a fairly substantial amount of time, what is driving them to get divorced after they've spent so much of their life with this individual? Some questions that come into my mind when I saw these statistics. But for us as Muslims and our communities, from my time as an Imam and my time working in the Islamic Council of Europe, uh, dealing with divorce cases and marital problems, I actually think the figure for Muslims is about the same around about between 40 to 50 percent of all marriages in the Muslim communities, I think they are ending in divorce, which is a, a huge tragedy to think about this, yes? And I'm sure if I asked you now to think of 10 people in your circle of friends, cousins, relatives on your age that got married and then count backwards as to how many of them got divorced, I think that a lot of you will come back with a figure of 4 to 5 out of 10. Yes? Just do it in your mind right now. Think of 10 people, mental exercise, that you know got married from your generation, so your friends, your... And then, out of the 10, think about how many got divorced. I'll give you just 30 seconds to do that in your head. Yeah? Has anyone made a calculation? I read the view. What figure did you have? Can you come with the figure? Three. Three, yeah? Ashab al Shiman. What figure did you come with? Ten people that you know got married and how many got divorced? Um, 
Four. Four. Subhanallah. They don't say any names, obviously. We don't want to expose anyone, really. Anyone else? Did you manage to work out how many? Brother in the front here, did you manage to? Five, five out of what then? <laughs> you managed to count five friends from your circle? Allah Musa. Anybody else? Umar. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Yes? One, yeah? Okay. This is the reason why I think speaking about this topic is super important because if this is the direction that we are going, it means that things may get worse before they get better. So let me just speak to you briefly about our Prophet Sallallahu and his marriage to Khatija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Because what he had with her would be described today as a perfect marriage of love, of romance, of affection and of companionship. So the story begins with the person is a young man and the sister of Khadija, she hires him to be the shepherd. And after seeing him go about doing this job as a shepherd, she tells her sister Khadija that this young boy or this young man Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam i never seen a person like this before. When he works and he's, a, he's, and he's expecting to be paid, he's too shy to come and ask for his wages. So Khatija, she was a trader, businesswoman. She was always looking for people that would represent her business interests in faraway lands. So she approached the Prophet ﷺ to be like her agent to go to Syria and to trade on her behalf. And in those days, many times if you were given a job like an agent, you would go and conduct business, but then you would keep some for yourself. You may lie about the amount that was sold and people would cheat often. So Khatija, she sent her servant and aid, Maysara, along with the Prophet ﷺ. This is obviously before he's a prophet. On the first trade journey, or the, his first trade journey, to Syria. And there, Maysara, uh, this servant, got to see the character of the Prophet. And when he came back, he said to Khatija that not only did we make 50% more profit than we have ever made on any of these business trips, but I have never seen a man as honest as this person. And Maysara praised and celebrated his character. And then Khadija, and there are two narrations about her age. Uh, Ibn Ishaq, he said in one narration that the, uh, the Khadija was 28 years old. And the other narration is that she was 40 years old. Many people, they only know about the view that she was 40 years old. But there is another view that goes back to the early second generation that she was in fact 28 years old. And the person was 25 years old. So she became impressed with this report. And because she was then a divorcee, she became interested in marrying the Prophet. So what happened is that she told Maysara to go and approach uh, Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet, and to make like an informal proposal. And Abu Talib he knew of Khatija as being the upstanding woman, noble woman, rich woman. So he was very pleased with this proposal and he told the Prophet ﷺ, what do you think about this? And some of the historians, they say that the Prophet ﷺ, he was so surprised that he would be proposed to by someone like Khatija that he, that he said, does she really want to marry someone like me? I am just an orphan. Yes, this is what he thought to himself. I'm just an orphan. So uh, Abu Talib, he impressed it upon him that this is a good proposal and their marriage was conducted. Now, if you just pause the story here, you learn a couple of things about look, searching for a spouse. Khatija radiallahu ta'ala anha, she, saw, she showed great wisdom in trying to determine the character of the man she wanted to marry. It was all because this is Makkah, so everyone knows everyone, right? It's not a huge town, 
people have grown up together. It's a very close, tight-knit community. So the reputation of Muhammad is already known to people. But it's only after this business trip and one of her close associates told her about his character and honesty and integrity that she then entertained the idea of getting married to him. And that's a big message for sisters today. One thing we find is that sisters, I mean, I'll give you an extreme example. Once I remember a sister, she found the fatwa line and she said, Sheikh, I want to get married to someone over Skype. Is this, is this halal? So the Sheikh said, over Skype, where does this person live? She said, oh, he lives in uh, France. So the Sheikh, he asked a very uh, sneaky question. He said, tell me, what will you do after the nikah? What will he do after the nikah? She said, he will come and visit me and he will consummate the marriage. So she, he said, sister, don't you see something wrong here? He doesn't want to be here for the nikah, but he wants to be here for the fruits of nikah. And she's like, what do you mean? And he had to spell it out for her. He said, this person is most probably trying to take advantage of you. And you know what she said? She said, yeah, Sheikh, but he said he's on the Quran and Sunnah. He said, this is, <laughs> does this amount to, you know, enough of an insight into this person for you to say, you know, this is the person I want to spend the rest of my life with? That they just say that they are upon the Quran and Sunnah, whatever that means to this person. So I think the penny dropped. And she said, okay, I think I understand what you are saying. And the Sheikh said, you should get your wali involved to try to find out who this person is. So if you learn from Khatija, she is teaching our sisters that when you want to get married to someone, there should be some level of investigation as to the character of this person. What do people say about him? What is his reputation like? Is he financially stable? Do you see? And part of the investigation is about how religious this person is as well. So anyway, the story continues that they got married and they were married for 25 years. And these were some of the best years in the life of the Prophet We know that he loved Khatija in a way that he never, never loved any of it otherwise because in these 25 years, he never took a co-wife. Yes, he never had another wife alongside Khatija. But after Khatija, every other wife he had, they were co-wives as well. So for 25 years, Khatija had his undivided attention as his wife. And in those years, he became a prophet. So 15 years after their marriage, in the cave of Hira, he received revelation and he's made into a prophet. And you all know the story that when that happened, the Prophet was shocked and disturbed by that experience and he thought he had gone mad. And when he came home from that cave down the mountain all the way back home, which takes about two hours to go from the top of that mountain back to the Kaaba, he came home in a state of fright and he said to his wife Khatija, Zammiluni, Zammiluni, cover me, cover me. And Khatija, she says that I waited until the shock had faded away and then I asked him, what has happened? He said, Ya Khatija Mali. He said, Khatija, I don't know what's happened to me. And then he said, I think, Laqad khashitu ala nafsi. He said, I'm scared for myself. I don't know what's happened to me. And then she said, Kalla wallahi ma yukhzik Allahu abada. She said, worse, reassure him. She said, I swear by God, Allah would never humiliate a man like you. You are someone who looks after the poor, takes care of the needy, and you keep the family together. Then she took him to her cousin Waraka, a man of scripture, and he explained that he had become a prophet, and that was Jibreel السلام, that had visited him. Now if you just pause there, you can see, number one, that the Prophet وسلم, in his most difficult moments, he wanted to share them, not with his best friend. He didn't want to go to any other person, he wanted to go to who? His wife. And this is the beginning of his mission as a prophet. If you fast forward all the way to the end, as he's leaving this worldly life, and he's in the pangs of death, how does he pass away? In the lap or resting on the chest of his then wife Aisha. So the beginning and ending of his mission 
is with the woman by his side. And not only that, Khatija, the way she reassured him, she showed great wisdom. And that teaches us another lesson about marriage, that our sisters, when they become wives, they need to be a positive influence on their husband. Just like Khatija was a positive influence on the Prophet ﷺ. She calmed him down, reassured him, and then gave him some direction. Why don't you go and speak to Waraqa? And if the Prophet ﷺ, a man who reached you know, the highest grade of character, he benefited from having a positive wife, what then about the rest of us? Yes. So then, if we forward the story a little bit more, we find that the year in which Khatija passed away was a tenth year of prophecy. And the whole experience of losing her was so dramatic that the year itself got dubbed Amul Huzn, the year of sorrow. And the companion said that the person he buried Khatija with his own hands. And he wasn't seen smiling for months on end after that, subhanAllah. But he still used to speak about Khatija in later years. So there's a few narrations, I'll share them with you and I'll end with this. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says that when I got married to the Prophet he would like to celebrate the praises of Khatija. And now, I mean in terms of time, a time frame, there's been uh, almost between five, five years that Khatija has passed away. And Aisha is saying that he still speaks about her. So she says, مَا غِرْتُ لِلنَّبِيِّ صلى الله عليه وسلم عَلَى مْرَأَةٍ مِّن نِسَائِهِ مَا غِرْتُ عَلَى خَتِيجَ Listen to this. She says, I never felt jealousy towards any of his wives like I did to Khatija. And then she said, لِكَثْرَةِ ذِكْرِهِ إِيَّاهَ Because he would just keep talking about her. And then she says, وَمَا رَأَيْتُهَا قَطْ She says, and I, I haven't even seen her. You know, like seeing the other wife and the way she is with your husband can make a woman jealous, no doubt. But then thinking about a woman that's not even in front of you, you've never seen her. She says, I was more jealous with her than all the other wives. And so one day she says, I started to like complain a little bit. So she says that in one narration, Sahih Bukhari, she says, you know, it's as if there's no woman in the world apart from Khatija. As if to say, you know, can you look over here, please? <laughs> She's gone, I'm here. And the person, he described Khatija. He says, إِنَّهَا كَانَتْ وَكَانَتْ He says, she was and she just was. Like, I can't find the words to describe her to you. SubhanAllah. So Aisha became even more jealous. In another, in another occasion, he's singing her praises. And uh, she, she says some unkind words about Khatija. She says something along the lines of like, you know, like an, you had someone who was old and someone you know, that had reached the end of their life. But now you have some, someone a lot younger. Allah has given you something better. And then she says, I saw the face of the person change color and he became angry. And he said, no, wallahi, Allah has not replaced her with someone better. He says, when I came to you people first, all of you said you're a liar. She said you're a man of truth. And she supported me like nobody else. That is how strongly he felt about her. Well, my most favorite narration is the narration of Allah Mahala. Listen to this. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala says that we were sitting inside our apartment. The person was sitting down, I was sitting down, and there was a knock at the door. And the woman gave salam and asked permission to come inside. And the Prophet Sallam, as soon as he heard her voice, he sat up. And he became, he like, joy filled his eyes. And he said, Allahumma hala. Oh Allah, it is hala. Who is hala? The sister of Khatija. And just hearing her sister's voice made him reminisce about Khatija. So Aisha says, I've never been so jealous in my life than I was when Hala turned up to our door and sought permission. I mean, this is like the stuff of movies, you know, the romance and the love. But this is not a movie, this is the life of our Prophet. 
And the reason I'm sharing that with you is because this is our aspiration for our own marriage. He is an example for us in every part of our life. No doubt about it, in the example of the Prophet do you have an excellent role model. A, a uh, uswa in Arabic is the object of imitation. Allah said not only is he the object of imitation, but he is uswatun hasana. He is the most beautiful object for you to imitate. Not sports stars, not movie stars. He is the one we aspire to be like. Now, having said all of that, this was just some introductory remarks just to get us to think about marriage in the way that Islam wants us to think about it. A lot of the times when you talk about marriage, people like to make jokes. Brother, would you like to come out for dinner? Wallahi, I need to get permission from Ministry of Home Affairs. One second. I may need a visa for this. Brother is getting married. Everyone says, ball and chain, are you sure you don't have cold feet? Are you sure you're going to sign your life away? All of these jokes. And in moderation, no problem. But when marriage is always the butt of a joke, that's not a good thing. It's not a good thing to be like that. You know, I remember once I was doing a nikah. In the nikah ceremony, I said, brother and sisters, let's not always make jokes about marriage as being something that is going to hold you back, going to depress you. Rather, we should speak about it in a positive way as well. So, I think the, the mess man, he wasn't listening to the speech because as soon as he got up to speak after me, he said, and I once said there's a hadith that whoever gets married completed half his faith. But when I got married, I was finished. <laughs> I just made a point about this brother. So having, having said all of this, Ikhwani, um, my hope through what we're going to have discussion now through some question and answers and then from yourself is to think about how we can avoid going down that path we we keep hearing about friends and family uh, ending their marriages in divorce and the situation is crazy i mean i'll give you i'll give you some context recently i met a brother he said my friend he's a professional photographer he goes around give, uh, 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 providing photography uh, services for Weddings. And he said, three years ago, he changed his policy on how he would take the fee from the customer. Usually, what he would do, he'd say 50% up front. Then after 40 days, your pictures are produced. You collect them and you get the other 50%. Three years ago, he changed it to 100% up front. They said, why? He said, because I had so many pictures that people weren't collecting, I would phone them, don't you want your wedding pictures? Sorry, we're already divorced. 40 days haven't even ended and people have already got divorced. So he said I needed to take everything up front because now people are getting divorced so much. My mom told me, subhanAllah, the shortest wedding she ever came across was one day long. And look at, look at the pettiness of this. She said that nikah, was on a Friday and uh, what happened in the nikah is that the sister's side turned up not on time no one turns up on time but close to on time and the brother came fashionably late the nikah was done they got married the next day the walima sister wanted to teach the brother a lesson she came even more fashionably late and when they sat on the stage together she said, do you know why I came late? I came late because you came late yesterday. I'm teaching you a lesson. He said, what? This is the woman I'm getting married to. I don't want you anymore. They got divorced on that day. Allahu musta'an. Allahu musta'an. This is really sad. But I only share these stories, not to sensationalize this topic, but just to give you a dose of reality. And to make us think about, you know, how are we going to change things? So on that uh, very sensational note, we start some questions, inshallah. What would you like to ask me? Okay, okay. so the question is about um, somebody wants to get married, but their parents are saying you can't get married until your older siblings get married. Generally speaking, when it comes to these cultural issues, we say that so long as it doesn't 
encroach on your rights in Islam or violate any instruction from the Sharia, try to maintain it in order to keep the family ties. So if, you, if you're like 18 years old and you've got a brother who's 20 years old and your parents are like, we'd like to get the older one married off first, don't say, what did it say that in the Quran and Sunnah? <laughs> Show me the ayah right now. Where is the hadith? <laughs> Only from Bukhari as well, not from Muslim. <laughs> so younger brothers and sisters, they become zealous you know, about these things. They say, oh, it's cultural. Let's chuck it out. No, no. And they say, and the, there may be some benefit in it. Yeah. And there may be some wisdom behind it. But the problem is when it goes to an extreme. And now a brother, he, he needs to get married because of temptation. Or because he's, he's ended up in a haram relationship. In that situation... Wow, this popcorn is awesome. Allah. Allah. For this, isn't it? Yeah. The, the, yeah. I don't know what they were expecting. Let's change the topic <laughs> now. We're talking about this. <laughs> um, in that situation, the parents need to give up these conventions and customs because they may well be doing zulm on their children. Yeah. Um, and I just want to put that in perspective. Yusuf salam, we know that he, was in a, he, he got to a dilemma in his life where it was either being forced to do something haram, indecent, or go to prison. Two choices. Either you do this haram zina, which is against your will as well, or you go to prison. He said, Rabbi as-sijn ahabbu ilayya. He said, going to prison is more preferable to me. I'd rather go to prison and sacrifice the rest of my life than having to do zina. So if your son or daughter is telling you, look, I'm in a very dark place right now. I'm in a haram relationship. You need to get married off. I can't be waiting for my sister or brother to get married. And you say, no, we're going to stick to this because this is the way it's always been done in our family. Youngest gets married last. Then you know what? A share of that haram will go on your head. Because as a father, you are in charge of getting your children married off at the right age. Okay, so this is uh, this is quite a uh, not just an interesting question, but deep. It's, it's a deep question. Yes. So if you have a sixteen-year-old son or daughter, or eighteen-year-old son or daughter, and they're saying to you, "Look, you know, I'm in a haram relationship," and they're saying to you, "Look, I want to get married." then obviously as a parent you're like this is not what i planned <laughs> i had planned for you to go to university become doctor sub and then get married you're just messing up the whole program but as a parent you have to appreciate a number of things firstly that there is nothing in islam that says you should wait until you graduate before you get married but there is something in Islam which is make sure your children are ready to get married mentally, in terms of finance, etc, etc. But that's only in an ideal situation. If your son is telling you, you know, I'm in a haram relationship, then there's no choice really for you except to get that, make that halal. Whether or not that marriage lasts is secondary. Whether or not that marriage lasts, the primary uh, you know, call of duty for you there is to stop that person, your son, your daughter, living in a state of zina, which is a major sin. It's a major sin. Is it, a, is it you know, is it a less than ideal scenario? Of course it's a less than ideal scenario. And it's a scenario that I pray that Allah preserves and protects every single one of us here from. But you can't be like out of pride. I'm not going to get my daughter married off when she's 16, uh, 18 because what are people going to say? Ultimately, what Allah thinks of us matters more than what people say. Okay, what can be done if a husband and wife both find each other boring, boring and spend time with other family friends rather than the spouse? So, you know, over the course of time, it becomes more of an effort to keep that spark alive in the marriage. Everyone knows this. But my point here is that it is worth the husband and wife investing time and effort to keep the spirit of that marriage alive. Not only to your, for your own selves, but for the benefit of your children. 
When your children grow up in a loving, warm home, that sets them up for their own happy marriage 20 years down the line. And when they grow up in a home where they're shouting, they're screaming, there's insults, there's bitterness, there's no love, that actually affects their ability to make loving relationships later on. Because kids, they, they think it's because of them. Mom and dad don't love each other because of me. And that has, that can be very traumatic for children. So my little tip for brothers and sisters is that if you're, you know, past the five year mark of your marriage or further, make a habit of every six weeks going out together for a nice meal, spending time giving each other undivided attention, this phone, don't keep it on the table, put it on airplane mode. Yeah, th that's actually a veto by the way. Put it on airplane mode, put it away, kids with somebody else, and it's just me and you, we're gonna just talk like we used to. Leave it in the car, leave it away, leave it at home. Leave it at home, yeah. yeah. Leave it at home. Even on airplane yeah. mode, people get done to all. let me just check on the kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> La ilaha la so I think this wasn't a question from your wife, this was a dig at you, Habibi. Yeah, this was a dig at you. Um, and not just have, have a nice meal together. I want you to go one step further and have a constant ongoing conversation about each other's development and aspirations and goals in life. Like I said about Khatija, she was a positive force in the life of the Prophet And as a wife, you must appreciate, you are the most influential person in your husband's life, usually. You know, in Surah At-Tahreem, Ajib subhanAllah, Allah says, Ya you and Nabi, lima tuharrimu ma ahallallahu lak. Who knows the rest of the verse? Tabtaghi mardat azwaj. Look at this. Allah says, Prophet, why have you made something Halal, haram on yourself, trying to please your wives. So here we have the strongest, you know, greatest human being, man, being told off because he tried to do too much for his wives. Or his wives had so much influence over him that they caused him to slip up. And he made something Halal haram on himself. Some scholars say it was it was a, a drink which had honey in it. But the point here is the verse is telling you that the Prophet he could be influenced by his wives. Even though he was, subhanAllah, you know, the strongest, most intelligent person. What then about us? But this is the thing, the influence can be negative or positive. Yeah, so in this sit-down, in this meal. I'm sure a lot of the wives will go home today and say, ah, oh, see, do you remember that part? This is 11 minutes and 33 seconds, by the way. Uh, you're going to be taking me out, inshallah. But in that, in that conversation, it's about, look, I know you. You can do better. You can work on your hiv. You can, if you want to just, you always want to study Arabic, why don't you start now? And she'd be like, you know what? I remember that you, in the beginning, you used to pray tahajjud, but I don't see you pray anymore. You know, why don't you start that habit again? And these type of conversations, these are the ones that will help you in the Akhirah. Yes, this is how you get a benefit uh, from your marriage. And I think things like this, they help to, uh, you know, make that marriage keep its spirit and avoid descending into just becoming like a very boring uh, and dry type of relationship. Right, so the question was from the brother, um, what characteristic you should look for in a future spouse? Okay, so we know the hadith of the person, he said that a woman is married for four reasons and the scholars say this can be flipped uh, to speak about a woman should marry a man for four reasons as well. And he mentioned in them beauty, he mentioned lineage, he mentioned wealth and then he mentioned religion, her religiosity. Firstly, the hadith is not saying skip over the first three to, and exclusively focus on the last. The hadith is saying all these things are fine, but by the way, the last one is the most important. This is the first point. 
The second point is that when you hear the Prophet say a person of deen, in our times, that translates to a very narrow understanding to perhaps a brother who, mashallah, prays five times a day, has a long beard and wears a thob. Yes, this person is on deen. But this is only half the picture. The other half is about how you behave with the creation of Allah. How does this brother treat his parents? How does this brother deal in business? Is he one of those mechanics? So you have a flat tire, he says the gearbox is gone. Yes. All of these things, the character with people and the character with Allah was all bundled together as being a person on deen. But in our times, the character part kind of falls to one side. So when the person I'm saying is that marry the one with good religion, it is this holistic understanding. Person who's got good character with people and good character with Allah. Uh, the only other point I would add to that is sometimes they people they they don't really pay attention to getting married to someone they find attractive. Yeah, and living in this very hypersexualized society that we live in, where indecency is all around us. It's on our phones, it's on the billboards, it's on the TV, it's on the internet. And we're living amongst a society that is becoming more and more promiscuous. It is so important that at home you find your spouse attractive and you are able to find satisfaction for temptations. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. Never before has it been more important. So my advice is that when you are looking to get married, of course you look for character, of course you look for this person's deen, but at the same time there should be an expectation that you will get married to someone who you find attractive. Can people take that to extreme? Of course. I'm sure we all know a guy who has not got married for so many years because he's looking for Miss Universe. Yes? And maybe in, in Jannah he will find her, but not in this dunya. So we're not talking about going to extremes, but we are talking about people that they don't really think of it as a big deal. It's like, you know, when you're young, you're like, I just want someone on Deen. Yeah. And then five years later, you're like, damn, what did I do? <laughs> yeah. And so it's very interesting. Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, he said that the first thing you should look for in a woman is beauty. The second thing is Deen. And the scholars, they say, what does Imam Ahmed mean? They say that he was talking about a person who makes a proposal. If he knows that she is a woman of deen, then he goes to see her and finds she is not attractive. He will decline her knowing that she is a woman on deen, which is not good. But if he first asked if she was attractive and saw her, and then found out she's on deen, then he would get married to her. And the fact that she was a religious woman would never be brought into any kind of disrepute. Do you, do you understand? He's not saying that it's more important for her to be beautiful than religious. In fact, he's saying the opposite with some wisdom. Yes, again, highlighting the importance of this. This is, this is one thing. Of course, this will add to the. You watch a lot of Bollywood movies, isn't it? Oh, no. uh, Taib, what was the other question? Uh, you're talking about balance. Balance, balance between balance parents. parents. Especially when they get older. Yes. They need more time with their parents because the wife doesn't want you to go. I mean, not, yeah. Not, not a doctor. You don't mind once in a month you go, but they don't want you to go daily. You know. okay. Taib, let's not get into the details, yeah, otherwise, yeah. 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 <laughs> start to. <laughs> might get involved in a domestic farmer. <laughs> So I think a couple of points. Firstly, it's very important that when you are about to get married, you are transparent with this sister of the expectations. For example, the next five years, I'm looking to stay with my parents. And when we're living together, we want to live together as a family. Yeah? And my parents, they, they're healthy, but there are some issues. And I would like you to help me look after them. Be transparent and up front. At the same time on the sister's side, they always like to ask, yeah, but Islamically, can he ask that of me? And my response is, that is a mute question. The reason being is, if I tell you no, what are you going to do? 
you're going to turn around and say, oh, I don't want to get married to you. Okay, then sister, you know, you know, you're going to make things difficult for yourself. Why not raise the bar and say, okay, if there's a level of sacrifice I need to show to your parents, which is tolerable and doesn't encroach on my rights, so you know what, I'll be willing to do that if it means I get to marry someone that I would prefer, someone who ticks more of the boxes. As opposed to having that black and white mentality is, yeah, but is it part of his rights to ask me to look after his parents? Because if you go down that line, sister, if you go down that line, brother, you will destroy the spirit of marriage. Marriage is not a business contract where you define the roles and expectations and then at the end of the year, you're like, okay, let's do a review. Did you, did you cook the food every day? Did you clean every day? And she's like, yeah, but did you give me the maintenance every month? Did you... You know, take me out shopping every month. Did you take me on that one holiday? From if you do that, you will destroy the spirit of marriage. It's very interesting in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't speak about the rights of a man over a woman or a woman over a man in detail. Allah said about the way women should be treated. Allah just said, live with them in a good way. That's it. Live with them in a good way. When it came to the man, Allah said, they are qawwamun. They are the ones that are in charge and they're supposed to spend on you. Did he go into the details of, yeah, and by the way, if the ironing becomes this much, then she deserves a, a, someone to come and help her. She deserves one holiday a year. You know, you know, all of these details, they're not there. Why? Because those details, they will make the whole relationship become petty. 